Welcome to our webinar today, Elementary Digital Tool Smackdown. Um, my name is Mary Carnahan, and I am the eLearning Resource Specialist with the Department of Education. And I get to host these webinars, which is really exciting because I get to hear all sorts of great things that are happening in our schools and classrooms all over the state. And you guys are in for a treat today. We've got seven great educators who are, who are willing to take some time out of their busy schedules to share their favorite digital tool with you today. So we will get started on that topic here in just a few minutes, but I want to cover a few housekeeping items before we get started. So you all were muted, your lines were muted as you joined the call today, so please keep your line muted. This will prevent any background noise that might come up, bells ringing or people coming into your room or dogs barking or kids talking, um, just so that we can focus on our presenters today. So please keep your lines muted. We do have the chat box open. You should see that over on the right side of your screen. And we will ask that you share, ask questions, share thoughts and ideas, um, and maybe even share your own favorite digital tool um, in that chat box as we go along. Um, hopefully our presenters will have time to answer any questions that come up um, in the chat box. We're, uh, we're, we've got seven presenters today. Each one has about five or six minutes. So we've got a pretty quick um, presentation time today. So we'll answer questions in the chat box as we go along. But if we have time at the end, we, we can answer some questions at the end also. Hopefully all of our presenters will be able to stick around until about five o'clock. And we will get you guys out um, hopefully right at five o'clock. Um, we'll we'll um, honor that time schedule. Make sure when you do use that chat box that you select everyone from the send to drop down. The system defaults to send to me, which means that I'm the only one that sees your, your questions and your comments in that chat box. So make sure you change that setting um, before you start asking questions. And I am recording this webinar, and we have a YouTube channel that we post all of our um, webinars to. So this will be posted there later this week or early next week, depending on when I get the file and when I am able to get that um, shared with you guys. I also am going to share the um, file so that you guys have the link. So I will send that out again in the next few days. Also, we do um, give a PGP point for this hour of learning. So if you have participated today, I will be sending out PGP emails um, to the email address that you shared when you registered um, in the next few days also. And I believe that is all of my housekeeping things. And if you have questions for me, also please share them in the chat box as we go. So this webinar, is its um, purpose is twofold. We do have an ongoing series called the eLearning Lab where we do monthly or a um, couple times a month webinars depending on the topics that we have. But this month is Digital Learning Month. So this is part of our, also our Digital Learning Month um, celebration. There is a Digital Learning Day toward the end of the month and that exact date is not readily in my head right now, but that is later in the, in the month. But we, a couple of years ago, decided that we needed, needed more than just a day to devote to digital learning. So um, we've, we have several things. They're listed here. This webinar, later in the month on the 20th, we have a webinar for secondary teachers. But really, elementary teachers can, can pick up things um, in that webinar also. So don't feel like it's just for um, the secondary teachers. This year we started a new, um, a new idea where we have eight different teachers who are creating videos for us, sharing their favorite digital tool. So we had our first one was released last Thursday on February 1st, and now from now on we'll be doing one every Monday and Thursday. So there was a new one released yesterday. We started our Winter eLearning Book Club this week and that is um, Social Media by Jennifer Casatad. That conversation started this week, so it's definitely um, a perfect time to jump in. 
um, grab that book from Amazon and start reading and start sharing um, and getting involved in that learning. And that's also um, going to award some PGP points. So if you're looking for a great um, learning environment and also getting some PGP points, that's a great opportunity. Um, our Twitter chats this month, we're um, using this month to, um, to get the, the Twitter chats um, around digital learning also, so, which they always are, but specifically around digital learning month. So this week is a small snowball discussion. Um, if you are in, in, interested in that, that will be Thursday night at 9 o'clock Eastern, 8 Central. And then one thing I neglected to put on my list is our Instagram inspiration. So if you follow us on Instagram, we are sharing um, different inspirational quotes by some um, digital learning leaders around the state and around the country. So we're excited to share that also as part of our Digital Learning Month celebration. So there's a lot going on there. The link to our Digital Month page is right there on the screen. Hopefully you've had a chance to jot that down. Um, and so now let's move on to our topic at hand today. So again, we've got seven educators who are sharing with us today. We've got Deb Gaff from Flat Rock Hawk Creek, Mark Carl from South Harrison, Mindy Stevenson from Westfield, Washington, Adriana Rojas from St. Mary Cathedral, St. Boniface, St. Lawrence, um, Joni Sullivan from Richmond, Jenna Eastham from Liberty Perry, and Steve Oslander from MSD of Washington Township. And each of them is going to share a different digital um, tool with you. And with that, I'm going to move on to Deb Gaff. I'm going to turn the mic over to you, Deb. And I don't hear you yet. Deb, are you there? Now you are muted, Deb. I'm going to try to unmute you. Deb, are you there now? Technology. Okay, Deb, I'm going to try to mute you and then unmute you. Hello? Oh. Me now? Try again. Deb? Hello? Yes. Got I me? I hear you. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Sorry. Okay. okay. Go ahead. That's okay. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'm Deb Gap from Flat Rock Hall Creek School Corporation. We're a small rural school district in Bartholomew County. Um, I teach uh, STEM uh, subjects mostly, uh, and I often post examples of student engagement via Twitter and Instagram, so you can follow me at Deb Gaff. Uh, next screen. The next, the tool I'd like to introduce you to today is called the Ozobot, and there are two styles of Ozobots in the collection. One is a bit, and the other is called Evo. I use the Evo because it is more functionality than the bit. The Evo has a remote control app, lights, sounds, and sensors, giving students a richer experience with the tool. When I first introduced the Ozobot to students, we observed them as they travel around a multicolored track. And I asked students, regardless of the age that I'm working with, to maintain a level zero, of no talking, and observe as many things as I can about the Ozobot. Observation skills are important soft skills for our students. Don't sit there and wait to be told, but let's make some observations and learn about the world around us. As you can see, the bots use their sensors to respond to colors on the track, and I walk around as they're observing and place my hand in front of the bot, and the sensors make it stop. And behind the bot, the sensors make it speed up. I love it when the students try the same, then pick up a pencil or paper to see if size matters. We debrief, and then we're making a connection to the real world. Students generally know about uh, robot lawnmowers and vacuum cleaners, but I also tell them about how important they are in the manufacturing process as robots follow lines or to deliver a product uh, to where it's needed in the manufacturing process. Uh, change screens. Next slide. 
Okay, sorry. Um, recently, I shared a lesson using the bots with third graders at Hope Elementary, and we started with a read aloud, if you were a polygon, and we learned about the characteristics of polygons, how to identify the shape as a polygon, non-polygonal, regular, regular polygons, even the names of polygons. And then students were challenged to create paths for their Ozobot. They were working on perimeters, so this was a perfect time to use rulers to draw polygons to specification and tell how far it traveled or the perimeter. This is a standard rich lesson. We start with a nonfiction read. We learn a new vocabulary. We apply the use of that new vocabulary. We go on to math standards, standard of mathematical practice for making connections to the real world, uh, understand that shapes uh, can be classified find the perimeters, and for some of our um, above grade level students, we started working on area. Um, we also use computer science standards, understanding connections between computer science and other fields, recognize that computers have intelligent behavior, and use technology resources. Next screen. So students can level up their experience with the bots by creating code with colors. The bot, upon reading the code colors, can perform tricks like speeding up, slowing down, or making like a tornado and spinning. It was delightful to watch the third graders persevere to learn how to make their markings neat and precise for the bots to follow. Uh, next screen. Here's another opportunity to use Ozobots to uh, level up students. Uh, challenges. This is for older students, maybe grades five or six, and I like the Ozoblocky Games website. This website works well with both iPads and Chromebooks. It is the next step for students who may have had an hour of code experience. The student is presented with a coding challenge like the one in the top right um, corner of the screen. They change the light to the color represented by dragging the blocks over, determine how many steps in which direction to change. Then they hold their uh, Ozobot on the uh, bottom right-hand corner we see it, and it will transfer the code to the Ozobot, and they can check their, their coding. I really like this activity because you're learning some important spatial reasoning skills. I've had students draw the challenge on graph paper and then walk the challenge to determine which direction the bot should turn and training their brain to make sense of shapes. And I hope to see these skills translate into making sense of nets later in the year. Next screen. You can continue to level up instruction with these versatile little bots. The Azabot website has a lesson library with ideas across the curriculum and across grade levels, even deconstructing code challenges for high school students. One activity becoming popular with the Ozobot is the use of 3D printed costumes. Um, using a student-friendly drawing tool like Tinkercad, for instance, to have students take precise measurements of the bot and create a costume. Measuring skills are often some of the lowest scoring areas for our students, so this is an opportunity for them to practice them with a purpose. We are currently working on station ideas for the bots in third grade with a special focus on measuring skills. Next screen. I really like the Ozobots as a tool because they can level up instruction across the grade levels and the curriculum, and it is an investment that serves the entire corporation. And that's Very it. good. Thank you so much. You were speedy quick. Thank you, Deb. No problem. And now, Thank you. Okay. And now we'll move on to Mark with Flipgrid. I think I can beat Deb with, oh, with well, regard to speed. I think I can go faster. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not erase. We want to be, oh, okay. you know, cover it well. So um, you're <laughs> gotcha. on. Thanks, Mark. All right. Uh, you can go ahead and go on the next slide there, uh, slide there, Mary. Hey, my name is Mark Carl. I'm the e-learning coach at South Harrison uh, Community School Corporation. Uh, we're in southern Indiana. We're right across the river from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, there's my contact information. Uh, so if you hear anything today that you like, uh, I'm going to assume, uh, I don't know if you covered this, Mary, but I'm assuming that the participants are going to get or have access to uh, the PDF that you sent to us earlier. Uh, if not, they can reach out to me, and I'll make sure I send them a copy because I've got some links embedded in my slides that they might want access to if they're interested in Flipgrid. Um, so if you go ahead and go to the next slide, please. 
So Flipgrid is essentially what, where I found Flipgrid or how I came across it is I, I worked with a great educator who, who taught me that before students can write down their thinking, they need to be able to verbalize their thinking. And as a technology uh, instruction specialist, I, I, I was looking for that tool that would allow the students to share their thinking orally. And so I went to a training and found Flipgrid. And basically what it is is it, it's an online platform that allows teachers to create uh, or post questions or problems to students' readings. Uh, it, they've kind of expanded what you can actually post now. And then the students then respond back to whatever question the teacher has posted by creating their own video response. Uh, and what I've, where I've seen this used in the classroom, it's really nice for uh, those situations where you have a class of 30 students, and we all know that in a class of about 30 students, there may be three to five students that are always the ones that raise their hand. Uh, with Flipgrid, you can post a question, and it gets sent out to everybody in the class, and everybody in the class is expected to respond on his or her device. And then the teacher can pull up the grid and very easily and randomly call on whomever he or she would like to voice what they thought. Uh, so it's a really neat way of giving every single student in the class a voice uh, in the discussion. Um, now Flipgrid, is a, there is a Flipgrid free account, it's called Flipgrid One, and it has some limited options. However, uh, I think you'd find once you get into it that the options that Flipgrid One provides to you are, are, are a lot, so you can do a lot with it. Uh, there is a Flipgrid classroom version, which I think belong, it costs about $65 a year per class, and of course there's a school plan and whatnot. Um, on this slide here, there's uh, some link. There's a link down uh, there at the bottom left that lets you get in there to see uh, and compare the pricing and what the accounts give you. On this slide as well, there's a link to the Flipgrid website. And there's also a link to a couple tutorials uh, that I've made for for the staff at my school, and I've made them available as well as some uh, things I've gleaned from the internet on how to use Flipgrid with language arts and Flipgrid with math and some Flipgrid uh, infographics as well. Um, so now it's a really easy tool. The teacher just records what he or she wants to say, pushes it out to the kids. Uh, Mary, if you'll go ahead and go to the next slide, please. And once you push that topic out to the students, the students will watch it and then they can respond back. Um, and actually when you get this, this PDF, uh, that little uh, screen there is actually a video of me walking through the process of how easy it is to create uh, your own uh, video question, and, and it's the same interface for the, for the students as it is for the teachers, so it's really easy to use. And then if you go on to the next slide, please, Mary. When you share it with the students, you have several options. Students don't have to have an account, which is a really nice feature of Flipgrid. So teachers can share with students using any device. Uh, students can access Flipgrid in one of three ways. They can either go to the Flipgrid website and type in the access code. Uh, they can also scan a QR code, which you see there, and they can also click on a hyperlink, or a hyperlink can be shared with them, and it will navigate them right to either the topic or the grid the teacher has created. And if you have your, your device out, if you scan or go to that hyperlink, or, or go to Flipgrid and type that code in, that's actually a Flipgrid I've created so that you can kind of see what the students would experience. It essentially asks you to think about Flipgrid and how you might be able to utilize Flipgrid in the classroom. And so feel free to check that out after today's uh, WebEx and, and, and let me know what you think. And you can go on to the next one there, Mary, and I think I'm wrapped up. There's my, uh, my contact information and my email, so feel free to, to reach out to me if you have any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Mark, for sharing Flipgrid with us. And now we will move on to Mindy with Artsonia. Hi, everyone. My name is Mindy Stevenson, and I am a K-4 art teacher at Oak Trace Elementary in Westfield, Indiana. And today I'm going to tell you about one of my favorite classroom tools, Artsonia. If you go to the next slide. Um, they market themselves as the world's largest student art museum. But in my classroom, I'm using it as a digital portfolio for my students. So kindergarten through fourth grade is uploading their artwork, and we'll have all their artwork um, in one place when they graduate fourth grade. For my younger students, um, I'm actually having parent volunteers photograph that artwork, but second grade and up, um, they are the ones photographing the artwork. 
And the other thing I love about Artstonia is we use it to write and publish artist statements for each of our artwork um, in third and fourth grade. Next slide, please. I'm just going to run through a few screenshots of how the students use the app in my classroom. I do have a classroom set of iPads, and for any art teachers out there that are dying to get their hands on a classroom set, we actually used our textbook money to buy those, so that can be done in your district if you're an art teacher that's um, struggling to get technology into your classroom. And the students, um, teachers and parents all use the same app, and you just log in with a QR code, and I um, just regenerate that QR code as needed, so you don't have to go out to a separate QR code reader to log in. Um, so it's really easy for students to log in. You can give each student a PIN number, but it's not necessary. Um, I do not do that with my students just because it's harder for them to remember. Next slide. And once the students are logged in, all they have to do is start typing in their first name to find their account. Artstonia is really, really good about protecting students' identities. So um, you will never see a student's last name or personal information on the app. Only when I log on to the website do I see that personal information. Um, once the student finds their name, they can see all of their artwork that they've uploaded. So um, in the screenshot on the right, you can see the student's artwork from three years ago that they worked on um, when they were in first grade, and now they're a fourth grader this year. Next slide. From there, the student will just click Add Art, and a list of art projects that they're working on will come up. I add those art projects in at the beginning of the year. They'll choose their art project, or yeah, they'll choose their project and photograph their artwork. And a recent feature that Artsonia has added is they have perspective crops, which when you're having young students photograph, that perspective crop is really important. Um, you can also do an auto adjust on the image, brightness, contrast black and white, and blur the image. Next slide. Students have the opportunity to add a title and an artist statement for their artwork. My students are writing their artist statement separately and then typing it in on the iPad. Um, but if you want to, you can add in questions for them to answer. So you can use it um, as a form of assessment along with the visual artwork. And then after they upload their artwork, their title, and their artist statement, um, it submits all that information to the teacher for review. So nothing gets published until I take a look at it and make sure everything's OK. Um, and this is, but this would be the last thing the students see. Next slide. This is the teacher view from the app. Um, and two, my two favorite things about this are I can pull up an artist gallery and view all of their artwork at one time. So I am not taking art projects home to grade. Once they're uploaded on Artstonia, I can see all the students' artwork at once, and I can kind of see what their strengths and weaknesses are and if they're mastering those standards. The, my other favorite thing about um, the teacher view is I can see all the artwork from one single project. So I've put Cezanne's inspired Apple still life up on the very right-hand side, and I can kind of see um, as a group, what am I doing well, um, and what do I need to work on next time I teach this project? Next slide. This is the teacher view from my computer. So um, some of my favorite things that I do um, from my computer as opposed to from my phone or my app is access the roster, I set up my projects, and then the most important thing is reviewing the student artwork, and I'll walk you through that real quickly if you go to the next slide. Um, as the student artwork comes to me, I can quickly um, click approve, 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 approve down the list if everything looks great. If I need to go in and make changes, for example, these two artworks, they did not rotate their artwork to the right orientation, so I need to go in and make some changes to these two artworks. Um, next slide. Um, and so if I click on those artworks, I can approve it, edit it, or I can send it back to the student. And if I click send back, there's an opportunity to, for me to add comments and tell them 
um, please re-photograph your artwork, it's blurry, or um, you did not use correct punctuation in your artist statement, um, please edit your artist statement so I can send that back to students if I need to. Next slide. And lastly, I can give um, student feedback to them. So here I said I love the shape of your buildings. I can tell they are um, towering high in the mountains. And if you don't have time to type out a nice comment for each student, there are some, you can go in and preset comments um, and just kind of auto-fill those comments um, if you have a large population you're teaching. Next slide. And lastly, I want to tell you that Artsonia is one of my um, biggest art advocacy tools because I have over 90% of my parents logged on viewing the student artwork. They can share. Um, the students' artwork with their grandparents and family members. They can leave comments for the students, um, and they can see my feedback about the artwork. Um, that's all I have for you today. Thank you. This app is totally new to me, and this is so cool. I want to second what Mark said and, and just say that it's great to see um, the arts utilizing technology in this way. And um, as I said in my comment, as a parent, um, this is a dream to not have that pile of, of artwork that your kids have brought home that years later you still just don't know what to do with. So um, I love this idea. Thank you for sharing this. And, and hopefully if we, have, we don't have art people in the, in the group, you'll take this back to your schools and share it with your um, art teachers. So next we have Adriana who is going to share Nearpod. I don't hear you yet, Adriana. Can you hear me? I can, yes, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, well, my name is Adriana Rojas. I'm the technology teacher for the Lafayette Catholic School System, and I was a technology integrator a couple years ago. And um, during that time, I came across Nearpod. Um, next slide, please. Nearpod is an interactive presentation um, that can assess at the same time and is, is really um, engaged for the students. Um, you can create presentations or you can um, choose from the pre-made ones. Um, Nearpod has a really big library of pre-made presentations that you can choose from. A lot of them are free, not, a, not all of them, but if you really like want to invest, I think that is $25 for the license, uh, it really has a lot to offer, the paid account. The students can access the teacher presentation using a code, so this works really good for the lower grades because the kids don't have to have usernames and passwords. They use a code. Um, most of the time the codes are just letters and they are not more than five letters. Uh, the lesson can be presented on teacher or student pace, and when it's presented as a teacher pace, uh, you control the presentation, and it, it displays in all the devices at the same time. Uh, when it's at a student pace, it's more like a homework, and you give them that code that it's good for 30 days, and then the students can view and move slides as their own pace. Next slide, please. When you just open the account, that is what you will see. And in my library will be all the presentations that you have created before or that um, Nearpod has and you can download them. Explore is just to get a look, take a look of what they have to offer, all the pre-made um, lessons. Join is when you click on it, you will be kind of like a student, so it will ask you for that code and you will join as a student. Create is the one that I use all the time because I create my own presentations uh, because I don't have a curriculum, so I have to create it my own. Um, and it gives you a lot of um, options to do. And then if you create a presentation that had any kind of assessment, um, it will create a report for you. Next, please. So this is when, um, when you click Create, I made this, um, uh, spreadsheet so you can have like an idea of what you can create with Nearpod. You can create content, add um, URLs, or you can create an activity. And I put this column right here where you can, you have to create the slides before 
or you can select. Like the 3D and the simulation in all the videos are really good for science. They have a really nice library for um, science topics. Um, the slideshows, you can create it in any kind of um, slideshow, um, like PowerPoint or PDF or um, Keynote, and you can just upload it, and, and it, it automatically generates all the interactive slides for you in Nearpod. You can add video, you can add um, audio. It's very, very flexible and versatile, and what I love is that I don't have to type anything for the students, like the lower grades really, like that I just push the URLs for them, and it appears in every single iPad, or well, we use iPad, but every, any single device. Uh, the activities are really fun for them, and I have learned to use them um, in a very different way. Um, next slide, please. This is an example of a drawing, and I like to use this for all the kids that, um, that need like reinforcement with spelling. So I add this background where they have to, with their finger or a stylus, they can select that little pencil on the bottom, and they have to trace all the spelling words that they have for that week, and they really like that. It really works well with um, kindergarten, first grade. Next, please. I like this one just because when we are doing, um, especially now that iStep is coming up, I do a lot of reading and comprehension in the iPads because that is the device that they are going to use to take the, um, the iStep. So we read something and then I do this kind of like fill in the blank and they have to select um, the, the words at the bottom and kind of like fill it in. And they, they don't feel like they are working, <laughs> they feel like it's kind of like a fun thing, but at the same time, it gives me an idea of who is doing their work, because all this generates a report for me. Next, please. Um, it, they have memory tests, and like I said, for lower grades, it's really good for them when we are doing spelling or when we are doing reading comprehension. Next. Uh, for early finishers, I love it because sometimes I'm working with a group of kids that have, especially when we are doing coding or when we are doing something a little bit more challenging for um, certain kids, all the kids that I know that they will be finishing in the first 15 minutes, I give them a code and they know that after they are done with the activity, they can just like go into Nearpod, plug the code that I will set up for um, student space, and it will have like this slide with all the instructions of exactly what they need to do next. Next, please. I create this um, quick guide for um, the teachers in our schools, and I hope that you guys can have it because it has like everything, um, how to access, what you can do. I include videos, links. Um, so I, I think that this, this, for somebody that really wants to know what Nearpod is about, this quick guide can be very helpful. Next, please. And I put a little bit of suggestions of things that I have done and, um, and what works better. Um, one thing that I have learned is that if you are going to use one of the pre-made uh, lessons, always review it first because they can look really great in the first few slides, but if I don't go through the whole thing, sometimes I'm like, you know, just skipping or wasting my time because some of the things don't apply. The great thing about Nearpod is that you can alterate those, like you can download to your library the pre-made ones, and then um, you can um, take out a slice that you don't want. You can actually like manipulate the whole thing after you download it to your own um, library. And then um, these are links. Uh, to, you know, a spelling lesson, a review vocabulary for when we are doing um, computational thinking and computer science vocabulary, this is near part works really good for them. Um, I, it gives me like the opportunity to review who's paying attention, to make sure that um, all the kids are like learning and, and getting engaged. So it's, it's very, very flexible. Um, and like I said, I have like this um, links that you guys can click on it and it will take you to the lesson. The other thing is that you can share this with other teachers, like I'm sharing this with, with this link with you. And that's all what I have. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Adriana. And um, I think I mentioned it before, but I am planning on sharing this um, slideshow. I'll send, I'll save it to Google Drive and send it out to um, everybody on this call um, in the next day or two. So um, you will have all of the links that our presenters are sharing with you guys. So um, thank you, Adriana. And now we're going to move on to Joni, who is going to share H5P. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I'm Joni, and I'm going to share H5P. And I heard about H5P at HEC last year. Um, and I played around with it a little bit last year. Um, but then we had some teachers that wanted to try some new things um, technology-wise in their elementary classroom. And we do have Canvas. So I really dug in over the summer with my um, colleagues, and we absolutely love it. So if you would go to the next slide, please. Um, so th these are some examples of things that you can create in H5P. Um, you can create, share, and reuse HTML content. Um, it's a free website. You just have to create an account. Um, we are able to embed it into Canvas easily. Um, they right now, um, they partner with Moodle and a couple other ones, um, WordPress, Drupal. So we have heard that they are going to um, partner with Canvas shortly. So we're hoping for that so then we can integrate it with our um, LMS and hopefully it'll be an LTI tool. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, go, sorry, go on. And th so this is one of the um, examples. It's an image hotspot, and this was something that we used um, for our intermediate schools. They, um, they go to Washington, D.C., so this was something that if they'd never been there, yes, they can Google things. Everybody can do that, but this was something that they could put into their student Canvas course that our intermediate schools use, and the image hotspots are on there, the red pluses, and each of those things are either um, a video, a, an image, text, or even a link to a website. So it was super useful for them. They could see the mall and everything that they would be able to um, go and see and the different museums. Next slide, please. Um, for primary, which is what I normally work with, this memory game was something was a game changer for some of our elementary teachers. Elementary teachers use lots of stations, and a lot of those stations, I was an elementary teacher, we use Teachers Pay Teachers a lot. We use a lot of um, lamination and things, and this was they wanted their students on a device, and they wanted them trying to learn a little bit about Canvas so they could make a memory game. Um, and it didn't have to be a letter to a letter. In this case, we used a letter to a picture. So um, the picture on the left is what, like one of my choices, so it didn't match. And then the picture on the right was the match. Um, so it would tell them that here's the letter, here's what it matches to. And if you can barely see it, but down in the corner on the left, you can see how long they spend on it and then it's going to tell them how many cards they've turned, and at the very end it's going to um, tell them all their matches were there. Um, so this was something that some of our primary teachers used, and then they had their students take a picture of, like a screenshot, and then uploaded it to Canvas. Next slide, please. Um, drag the words. This, was, this is probably one of the easiest ones that you could create. Um, it helps with those technology-enhanced questions that are on ISEP, especially for those new third grade users that have never taken, you know, an online standardized test. Um, the opportunities here are endless. The creation of this is pretty easy. Um, the other cool thing about H5P is, besides that it's free, it has tutorial videos for everything. Um, you just, you would log in and find the content you want, and then there's a tutorial for every single one of the creations you can have. Next slide, please. Um, drag and drop. So I saw lots of my primary teachers do the centers where they had to do word sorts. Everybody does word sorts. And so I had one teacher that asked, can you please teach me how to do something like that um, in Canvas? Well, this was the easiest way for me to do that. 
this is not a word sort, this is actually, you know, a timeline you can see, but it's the same concept. Um, the left picture is the start, and then the right picture is what it was once um, the student finished. And again, it shows you the score, and then they can retry. And in their case, since it doesn't integrate yet with Canvas, they just take screenshots and they upload it as an assignment to Canvas. Um, next slide, please. This is probably my new favorite um, H5P that I found. Um, they release things almost monthly, and this course presentation is probably my new favorite. Um, again, third graders, they, you know, they're just introduced to this testing environment. They have two high-stake tests, and this course presentation, um, I was, you're able to put lots of different things in, and so this was a practice for them for those um, the phonemic awareness part of iRead with the teacher being able to assess them at the very end. If you see the bottom right um, slide, you'll see that here's all their choices and they didn't do very well. They got a zero out of five. So the very first screen is a video telling them, here's how you do this. If you go to directly to the right, the very first one, you see your audio button. The audio tells them, I want you to find the word that has the same beginning sound as whatever, and then the bottom left is their try. They can retry or they can move on, and then at the very end, you know, it gives you a final score. Um, you could add as many slides as you like, and there's tons of different multimedia you can add into, into there. Next slide, please. So when Mary gives the, um, presentation, the PDF to you, this actually is real examples of H5P. It's a link to a public Canvas course, so even if you don't have Canvas, it's not a big deal. You can access um, the course that we've created, and you can see all the different ones that, like examples that we have. And then um, if you choose to create an H5P account, um, there's a slide in there that, or a page in there that you know, takes you to the tutorials and things. And then next slide. Um, so I'm Joni, and I'm an e-learning specialist in Richmond, Indiana, and I would love for you to follow me or email me, and we do have a Twitter chat every Tuesday night that we um, host. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much, Joni, for that great information. That's a, a, a tool that I had never heard of before, so it's great to hear about that. And next, we're going to move on to Jenna, who's going to talk about Pear Deck. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenna Eastham, and I am with Liberty Perry School Corporation, and I am the Technology Integration Specialist. Um, I'm going to talk about Pear Deck add-on. So this is an add-on in Google Slides um, that I absolutely love. So if you want to go to the next slide, please. Um, why I use Pear Deck add-on in Google Slides is because it makes it now an interactive slideshow. So it's kind of similar um, to Nearpod, and I, but now I am in love with Pear Deck, so I've moved on to that instead of Nearpod. Um, the awesome thing is it'll collect different feedback and um, makes it interactive while you're working with your students. Um, and it also is awesome because you can insert these and make your old slideshows that are already created. You can insert them and make those interactive that are already completed, or you can use it for new slideshows that you're working on currently. Next slide, please. So this is just going to kind of walk you through how to use it. Um, once you're in Google Slides, if you haven't used add-ons in Google, um, if you look at the red arrow, you have a whole add-ons button. Um, and this is kind of like rainbow order. So red is your add-ons, and then orange is where you would get your add-ons. So if you don't have the Pear Deck add-on, you would go to get add-ons, download it, or install it, and then it'll just show up where that yellow arrow is. So once you have Pear Deck, it's there, um, and then you are going to click on the open Pear Deck in the sidebar, and if you'll go to the next slide. So once you have Pear Deck, um, it opens this awesome slot or sidebar for you while you're working on your presentation. So it'll be on the right hand of your screen while you're looking at all of your slides. 
Um, and it's actually already better than it was at the beginning of the year when I started using it. But it's separated now into three different categories, if you see on the left side. So you have beginning of lesson, during the lesson, and end of lesson. And these are examples of types of interactive slides that you can stick in. So there are slides where students can um, write text. There are slides where they can draw. There's draggable slides um, for beginning of lessons. And then middle, it kind of expands, and it's text slides, multiple choice slides are added, graphing, mind maps, um, click on the correct choices. And then again, you have your end of lesson. You could really insert these anywhere in your presentation. That's just how they um, se separate them. And then um, on the right side, it kind of shows you once you're looking through those and you find the one you want, literally all you have to do is click on the type of slide you want to insert into your presentation, and it creates that slide for you um, that is then completely editable. If you'll go to the next slide. So these are just some examples of ones that it would insert. I love it because it actually, um, especially like the beginning and the ending, kind of gives you um, intros that are already created for a lesson or exit ticket ideas. Um, and then you can edit any of the slides however you want, but I like that they're kind of pre-made and they give you ideas on how you could automatically insert it. So this would be a draw one that they insert, and so it just tells you to draw two things and the students would literally be able to draw right there in the two boxes. Next slide. Um, this is a draw or type to label the diagram so they could choose um, which way they prefer to do it if they prefer to draw or prefer to type. So you could use it for labeling. Next. Um, I am a former middle school math teacher, so before I went to the tech route, so I love anything that incorporates math. Um, this is an easy way to incorporate um, math they can draw on there, so you can give them different math problems. It would be great using with shapes, um, measurement, geometry, things like that. Um, but they can just graph right there on their screen. Next. Um, this is a matching one, so they can um, draw on the screen to match the different um, names in Spanish with the colors. Next. And like I said, these are all completely editable. So as soon as you find something that you're like, oh, I want a matching one, you can edit them however you want. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. They used to call it a temperature check. Um, but at, you'll look at the bottom, you'll see that blue dot. So every student would have a blue dot, and they just drag it um, to tell where they're feeling. Um, so the thumbs up that's green and the thumbs down that's red, that's what this slide really comes with, but I just kind of threw those pictures on there to show you. So if you were a dog person, you could drag your dot to the dog, or if you're a cat person, you could drag your um, dot to the cat. But this is an awesome way to just get a quick check of, are students ready to move on? Are they understanding the material? How does it work? Um, go ahead and click on the next slide. Um, this is one of the exit tickets if you wanted them to just type. So maybe you've done a mini lesson and now you want them to just dump out whatever they have learned um, or thought the most important thing was from the lesson. This is also um, great for elementary like other people have mentioned since they're going to be taking um, the test online and getting them used to typing and answering those questions online. Next slide. So once you create it, then it's kind of like, okay, what do I do? How do I easily get this to the students? It's super easy. It kind of goes um, the Kahoot route where you just have a code for them to um, join your lesson. So if you go to the next slide. When you're ready to present it to your students, um, you'll go back to that add-on button into your Pear Deck, but now you'll have the present with Pear Deck option. So if you go to the next slide, once you hit present with Pear Deck, it's going to um, give you this slide, which then um, you can either project to your students, or I usually have students um, just add that to their home screen. We have iPads, so we add that as a bookmark to their home screen um, for joinpd.com. 
Um, and then it will have them type in this code and it will actually collect their, we have um, Google emails, so it'll collect the students' Google mails um, right when they log in. So then you're gonna know um, exactly which students are putting what, what to it. So at the bottom where that yellow arrow is, it says no students have joined. It will tell you every time that number when students are joining, so you'll see all your students are joining. And then if you look at the green arrow with the three dots for the more actions, um, you can actually control the pace of it, so you can lead it and teacher or students can't go on without you. Or if you decide this is something I want them to go through at their own speed, um, then the students, um, you can make it student paced and students can go through it at their own speed. Um, but I love that you are actually gonna be able to collect the data automatically from students as you're working on it. So you can see the responses or you can project responses and it won't show any of the students' names, but it collects that data for you so you can see which students are saying, I have no idea what's going on, or you can look quickly through their graphs and say, this student needs to meet with me later, they need more help. If you'll go to the next slide. I'm a person that has to see um, the student view, so this is what it looks like if you're projecting. Um, this would be on the screen, just the um, drawer type, the label, and then on your screen as the teacher, you have all these options. So you have your slide navigation on the left, um, the number of responses. So each time you go to a new slide, it's gonna collect those responses from the students, so you can see how many people are participating and are being interactive. Um, it keeps the code, so if a student happens to get kicked out or something, it's right there for students. Um, they can easily join. Um, then, I, like I said, you can project student responses. The other thing I love is sometimes once you get into a discussion um, with students or you're presenting the new lesson, new questions come up that you don't ever think about putting in. So you can easily just add a new question um, while you're in the middle of your presentation with your students. Next slide, please. Uh, and then once you um, create your slideshow or your lesson, then this is what the student view um, would look like. If you'll go to the next one, please. So this is one where their toolbar is now up. So as you're presenting the lesson, um, you can ha let them choose different colors to write with. They can choose their different tools at the bottom. There's the eraser, the text the highlighter, the pen, um, all of your normal text tools that you would have. Next slide, please. Um, here is an example of the blue dot. So each student would move and drag their blue dot um, across the screen to wherever they want. I'm a dog person, so I put my blue dot on the dog person. Next slide, please. And then if it's not an interactive slide, they just won't have any of the um, tools available to them. So they can't do anything on that screen besides look and listen to what you're telling them. The tools only pop up on the interactive slides. Um, I hope that you enjoy Pear Deck add-on also. I'm on Twitter and there's my email, so if you have questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them and help. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jenna. And now we are going to end with um, Steve and Skype. I don't hear you yet, Steve. I don't hear you, Steve. I'm going to try to mute you and unmute you on oh, the system. I'm sorry. Oh, I was that's okay. Sorry. Okay, I hear you now. Go ahead. I already started. Sorry. I'm Steve Alslander. I'm a fifth grade teacher at Allisonville Elementary School. I'm a Skype master teacher, um, and I'm excited to teach you all about how I use Skype in my classroom. Uh, Skype in the classroom is a trans transformational tool that I'm excited to share with you. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, so why Skype in the classroom? First of all, Skype in the classroom, if you're not aware, is a free online um, online community of educators who are interested in global collaboration 
and um, it's, it's, it's a website. Uh, why Skype in the Classroom? It's because, quite honestly, it's engaging. If you see the bottom left-hand corner, those kids are absolutely engaged in a global collaboration with a fifth grade class in Kansas. It teaches soft skills, such as eye contact, confidence, empathy, you know, in today's world. It's so critical for kids to connect with other kids who are from different backgrounds. And quite honestly, it allows you to make your learning come alive. You see in the bottom right-hand corner, we went on a virtual field trip, uh, a live interactive virtual field trip that made uh, our learning about explorers come alive as we entered um, a conquistador ship. And it was at the Maritime Museum in San Diego. And we had a free lesson and the gentleman dressed up like a conquistador and explained his perspective on exploration, which was really neat. And there's tons of free, live, interactive, virtual field trips you can find right on the Skype in the Classroom website. You go to the next slide. So getting started, um, the first thing you need to do is, like I mentioned, uh, go to the Skype in the Classroom website and create a free account. Um, and when you do that, you have a lot of options at your fingertips. Also, you want to make sure that you have a Skype account that you could Skype from your classroom and a webcam, of course, but most computers these days have those as well. But again, go to the Skype in the Classroom website, create a free account. That's really the first place you want to start. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Also, before you make your first Skype call, in your classroom, I always recommend that you do a test call first. So I always Skype with my parents. We do a mystery Skype, uh, which I'll be talking about. And I have my parents pretend to be from somewhere else. Uh, in this uh, picture, they're pretending to be from Iceland, I believe. Um, and my kids, uh, it's really helpful first to see if there's going to be any tech, tech difficulties, but also it gives the kids a chance to be set up for success. They, they know where they're supposed to look, how they're supposed to speak, um, things like that. So you want to set them up for success by having a test call first. We also, I also recommend teaching the kids Skype etiquette. Um, that includes, again, eye contact. But also when we play games, we play a lot of interactive, interactive games via Skype with other classes around the world. And it's important to teach sportsmanship and things of that sort. Another tip that you may not know is if you share your screen via Skype, you can play games like Kahoot with another class around the world. In fact, this year during skype -a my class played a 10-nation global pop culture Kahoot with 10 countries, and all the questions were strictly pop culture related, and it showed the kids how we are more alike than we're different. It's all the kids' new lyrics to Taylor Swift. It's pretty neat. All right, next slide. So Mystery Skype is one of the uh, multiple things you could do on the Skype in the Classroom platform. It's, it's I think, the most engaging uh, activity that I can do with my kids. They love it. It's a 20 question style guessing game where two classes have to find each other's location first using yes or no questions only. Every kid has a job, and if you're interested, I'm happy to share my jobs that I've created with, with, with you. Uh, and every kid is working to try to find the other class's location first using yes no questions, using logic, problem solving, geography. Once the classes find each other, they gather and they share about their culture, about their communities. It's, it's a great way to establish a relationship for future collaborations as well. Next slide. I also mentioned virtual field trips. That's another free tool you can grab right from the Skype in the Classroom website. And there's tons of free interactive and live field trips that you can find that are connected to your curriculum. Here, if you're studying animals and adaptations, we, I took my kids and the entire fourth grade uh, to Antarctica, where we Skyped with Jean Pennycook, a scientist who studies Adelie penguins. We've gone to the, uh, the Buffalo Bill Center, where we learned about Native Americans, and the, and the uh, curator showed multiple artifacts made from the buffalo, as opposed to just reading about it. There are so many virtual field trips you can find. You can filter based on your curriculum. And again, learning comes alive. It's just a neat way to uh, supplement what you're teaching already. Next slide, please. There are also Skype lessons, where, which is similar to a virtual field trip, where guest speakers will come in and, and give a lesson to your, to your students about, a multiple, about multiple things, such as computer science, real-world issues, which often will inspire the kids to take action going forward. These kids on the bottom left 
after learning about girls' education through, um, through a Skype lesson, they created a project to present to the community about the need to get girls in school, all from a Skype lesson. Next slide. I mentioned taking action. Another Skype lesson that we did was with the Beagle Freedom Project. I found this, and it's right on the Skype in the Classroom website, and my kids learned about the horrors of animal testing. And two of my girls were so moved by this that they did further research. They contacted our state legislator and met with him, and they uh, persuaded him to draft a bill uh, for, legislat for the legislative session this year that would help the beagles, the animals, from animal testing. In fact, he did sponsor it, and uh, my students and I went down to the State House and testified on behalf of the Beagle Freedom Project to try to get the bill to be made into a law. Didn't quite happen, but it was amazing that my kids were able to take action that far based on a Skype lesson. Also, we played a mystery Skype with a class in Nigeria. That teacher messaged me that morning to tell me that they had to cancel. They only had one map, and that map was lost. And my kids, we played Mystery Number, a game that we created uh, instead. And afterwards, my kids were so moved, they decided they would write a grant to ship maps to that fifth grade class in Nigeria. Our PTO funded it, and a few days later, we shipped them a class set of maps um, because my kids saw a need from, from a Skype activity, and they took action. Next slide. There's also Skype collaborations where you can register for free projects that you could do with other classes around the world. Right now, I'm scheduled to do the virtual Valentine's project with a fifth grade class in Sweden, where my class will be exchanging digital Valentines with the class in Sweden. There are several other Skype collaboration projects that you can explore right on the Skype in the Classroom website that I encourage you to check out. Next slide. So again, Skype in the Classroom is magic. There are so many things you can do to, that are real and authentic to make learning come alive. And I'm happy if you have any other questions about Skype in the Classroom, kind of rush to get it in. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to uh, message me on Twitter. You can go to the next slide, and I think my Twitter handle is there. Yep, S. Auslander. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. We went a few minutes over, but I think it was well worth the time. Um, it was, it's a lot to get that much information in in an hour. So I appreciate our seven presenters. Um, I appreciate your flexibility and your willingness to give of your time to prepare for this webinar and then to take the time to present today for all of us. Um, and thank you to everybody who joined us in this hour of learning. Um, as I said, I recorded this webinar, hope to have that available by early next week on our YouTube channel, which you can get to from our website um, that's right there at the top of this page. I will also be sending out PGP emails in the next day or two, and I will also send to everybody who was on the call today a link to this um, slide deck presentation um, that I'll save to um, out to Google Drive so that everybody can get to it. So again, thank you to Deb and Mark and Mindy and Adriana and Joni and Jenna and Steve for sharing with us today. Um, everyone have a wonderful evening, and we will hopefully see some of you in two weeks when we have our next webinar, um, Digital Tools Shared um, by and for secondary teachers, but hopefully it will also relate to some elementary teachers also. So thank you guys very much, and have a great evening. Bye-bye.